Welcome, Molly Crabapple. I'll start by telling a myth. In the bad old days, there were gatekeepers. There were galleries and labels and publishers, sinister creatures who scooped up young talent, sucked it dry, and discarded it with nothing but a royalty statement to cover its sold-out husk. Gatekeepers were exploitive and uncaring. They drank highballs at old boys' clubs. They trampled on the connection between artists and fans. The gatekeepers, the myth goes, are dying. They've been slain by the sword of the internet. And now, armed with the tools of the network, we artists can storm the gates. It's a good myth. For a long time, it's one I uncritically believed. I believed it because I was one of the network's success stories. I was a dropout who for a decade hustled out a living in the good and bad corners of the internet. I'd used every online tool and every bit of blood in my body and at the end of everything, I got art's holy grail. Without the approval of any institutions or gatekeepers, I got to fly around the world painting pictures. I was always a hustler, and in a network society, hustlers win. Hustling has always been the mode of life for people outside the power structure, but those who want it in. You hustle because there is a giant wall in front of you, and you will bash yourself bloody until you get to the other side of it or die trying. You will not consign yourself to the role society has for you. Hustling is the opposite of keeping your head down, working for the man, and being content. But the role of the hustler becomes a trap when there's no possibility for contentment, when there are no good jobs working for the man. Aided by the technologies that promise to liberate us, traditional social safety nets and decent jobs have been destroyed. This is true for artists, but it's true for everyone. In America now, we must hustle or die. Before I talk about the new world for artists, I want to talk about the old. Most specifically, I want to talk about my mom. My mom is an amazing artist. She did packaging for children's books. She is sweet. She is brilliantly talented. She burnt herself out working hard for her employers. But then computers changed her field. Going through a divorce, dealing with a family death, she didn't have time to learn them. The industry changed, and despite all of her talent, all of her hard work, she was left behind. She didn't even own her own artwork. I swore this wasn't going to happen to me. I would make myself wanted not just as a good worker, but as myself. That way, I reasoned, I wouldn't be discarded so easily. It turns out the future is a rough place for good workers. The old bargain of security for obedience is dead. People who worked hard and were good at their jobs have found their jobs mechanized, gamified, or outsourced to Bangladesh. This goes for designers and artists as well as for anyone. For artists, as in so many other fields, the future belonged to those who were entities in and of themselves. I've spent the last 12 years using the internet to carve out this space for myself, a space where I could make the art I wanted. As a broke 18-year-old, I lived off of Craigslist. Craigslist then was a libertarian, text-based utopia where people were considered clever enough to make their own arrangements. You could sell a couch, or you could get $300 for having live crickets poured on your face while you writhed around in a bikini, which was totally something I did. <laughs> <laughs> Craigslist was my first social network. It gave me my first jobs, my first art jobs, and the naked girl jobs that sustained me while I got to be good at art. I started my first company when I was 22. Dr. Sketchy's anti-art school was a reaction to every objectifying life drawing class I had posed for. Instead, models would be underground performers that were celebrated, that were glamorous, that were these amazing muse personas. When I spammed live journal communities, you can tell this is back in the day, about my little drawing class, it exploded across the world. Now people in 140 cities from Lima to Johannesburg to Paris have, have Dr. Sketchies. With no funding and with no business connections, the internet let me hack together a company. But it was Kickstarter that changed my life. To independent artists, Kickstarter means more than the NEA. 
It let our ambitions match those of people with galleries and people with rich fathers. It said that Kickstarter, or the network as a whole, is only good for people who are good at self-promotion. But self-promotion has always been cheaper than, in any, than an MFA. Kickstarter took me from survival thinking to being able to contemplate art for art's sake. My last show, Shell Game, was a giant tribute to 2011 spread across nine six-foot-tall canvases. It opened riotously in New York. It took me a year to paint a 14-hour days where I would devolve into a feral paint beast and it was made possible with Kickstarter. The gallery system never wanted me, but even if they had, there's no way I could have worked according to the gallery model. No way I could have painted for a year unpaid with my fingers crossed that all those paintings would sell at the end of it. I'm a former professional naked girl with no degree and a clinically diagnosed case of oppositional defiant disorder, and yet I'm here. That, mean I, that means I won the network. Perhaps not coincidentally, I believe the internet is still the greatest hope for art in America. The comedian Jamie Kilstein recently tweeted, you can't even make money by selling out. You just sell out to sell out. Kilstein was drummed out of mainstream comedy because he didn't think rape jokes were cool. Because of the network, he still has amazing successful DIY tours and has a super popular podcast and gets to make a living. Sexist gatekeepers be damned. When I see artists like Jamie defying institutions and thriving, I grin hard because I don't believe that pleasing power should be a prerequisite for making a living doing what you love. Gulping down espresso with Cory Doctorow this morning, he spoke to me about how the network gave creators the chance to wring better deals out of institutions. With the network, there is always another option. The network, at its best, Supports projects like Stop Telling Women to Smile, where the street artist Faz travels the country wheat pasting anti sexual harassment posters. It opens hacker spaces in Baghdad. It funds the defense of embattled journalists like Barrett Brown. Sex workers in Mumbai use it to talk back to racist documentarians who thought they were voiceless. It lets depressed kids who defiantly dream of being artists reach out to their favorite creators and get hope. But are the gatekeepers really dead? While it may be easier than ever for artists to publish, that work still requires time and often expensive materials to make. And artists are still flesh and blood beings who exist in a capitalist world with rent bills and medical bills. Artists may be able to bypass the publishers, galleries, and labels who once snubbed them, but the gatekeeper now is money. My favorite art history teacher was an Iraqi refugee who worked as a security guard at the Met. One day, he asked the class what made a city an artistic capital. We said a bunch of things like cafe society or big ideas or smart people. Nah, it wasn't that. Money, it was money. Money to support the art. Rebellious freedom is inextricably wed to capital. Conversely, poverty stifles art. Without money, you're too exhausted by your day job to work to your full potential. You can't afford the help or the materials you need to make work that is as good as you're capable of. A society where the price of striking out on your own is potentially dying of an illness you can't afford to treat is one where mostly trust fund kids get to sing and paint for a living. The gatekeepers demonized for exploiting artists also invested massive quantities of money in those artists' successes. Now, the social media companies that we use to promote our work and whose platforms we attract fans to have no corresponding interest. The great irony of the network is that the companies who let us express our whole humanity only care about us as clicks, eyeballs, and fingers. The new networked world, attention is supposed to be currency. But on most sites, hard currency flows only to the top. Artists are expected to live in a Gnostic world of likes and reblogs. Just as technology threw open the gates for artists, it devalued our work. Art, journalism, and music have largely become uncompensated filler around which to wrap online advertising. Because there's so much of it churned out so quickly, sites feel no need to pay. Even the word content makes Shakespeare and cat videos totally analogous. This is sold as populism. Anyone can be an artist. Post your work for free. 
creators will make platforms money because they just post so much work on them. And as for the creators themselves, somehow they might profit off of the attention. But as my friend, the indie musician Kim Bookbinder says, turning likes into dollars is a rare alchemy. What started out as a devaluation of creative labor became a devaluation of all labor. The Atlantic asked respected writers to work for free while still somehow saving gobs of money to pay to Jonah Goldberg. The punk porn site Suicide Girls told women, post your naked photo sets unpaid and if enough people click on them, we might give you a submarket paycheck. Gamification combined with slashed social safety nets and disappearing middle class jobs to create things like mechanical turking, where you can do the work that computers don't want to do for pennies. Or a lift, where you can turn your car into a cab, but instead of a fare, you get a donation. In the networked utopia, no work has intrinsic value except the work of building and maintaining the network itself. And what's the problem with this, you might ask? I mean, creators, they, they willingly work for free. Won't the best work, given exposure, just ride to the top? Won't the crowd discover you just as curators were once supposed to? If you're just good enough? Well, yes and no. You see, the crowd is a far more diverse and egalitarian judge than eight dudes from New York who went to Yale. You are more likely to find your audience amongst hundreds of millions of people than a grant committee or the board of a gallery. But the type of art you're able to create in the first place is intrinsically linked with how much money you have. And this is something that platforms like Kickstarter mitigate, and they do help with so much, but they cannot erase it. And the millions of dollars of venture capital money showered on the dude who runs Bustle shows us that real money will probably just go to the same wealthy white dudes it always went to. Money begets money. It did in the old world, and unfortunately, it still does on the network. I know this from experience. Every dollar I clawed, whether it was from modeling or an early gig drawing naked dudes for Playgirl, served to amplify my advantages. My last big art show, Shell Game, the one I funded on Kickstarter, would have been impossible without the money and the network of contacts I'd spent a decade building. I never could have hauled those massive slabs of wood up the stairs of my fifth floor rat-infested walk-up that I once lived in. I never could have painted them in the lightless room I once shared with three roommates divided up by shower curtains. Without an assistant, I never would have had time to paint that show. And without sponsors, I never could have afforded the paint. Sometimes curators look at my work and they say, why didn't you ever paint like that before? I'd answer, because no one ever gave me enough money to be able to. A decade of practice honed my talent. The cash let me express it. To pretend otherwise is to spit in the face of every single broke genius who can't afford materials or time. It's to say, hey, I just got here because I'm better than you. And I am good, but it was never about that. In the future where all but the most elite artists lack institutional support, artists must take on the financial burdens and logistical tasks that institutions once dealt with. Artists are becoming companies, but they don't have any of the startup capital or resources companies have. On one hand, this is massively freeing. You can just say, fuck the man, I'm doing what I wanted. On the other, you win if you have startup capital provided by your dad. To the rich kids go the spoils. Take music. Record labels, they're so evil. They're evil reptiles. But since their fall, charts have gone from domination by working class kids to ones born into wealth. Brett Anderson, the front man for the band Suede said in a recent interview, because the price of getting heard has risen and the music industry has been hurt, it's becoming a hobby of public school boys. That, that's British, by the way, for kids who went to Eden. It's tragic. Music was once one of the few places on earth where privilege got you nothing. As piracy decimated labels, musicians became more and more squeezed. They were caught in a model where the only way to make money was to sell merch on expensive, exhausting tours. But you can't tour if you're ill, you can't tour if you have a child, and you can't tour if you're caring for a sick parent. Meanwhile, the royalties that once served as American artists' only pensions are vanishing. Suppose the successes of DIY, like Radiohead or Trent Reznor, are often ones who had corporate backing in their formative years. Without, with corporate cash, they built a following that would later support them when they went independent. 
and good for them. They're amazing. I love their music. I love what they're doing. But their models are irrelevant to artists who never had corporate cash to begin with. These are the contradictions of the network. The network has many contradictions. Those NSA spying devices we all carry around with us are also the tools for a renaissance of global rebellion. The internet, which is a space of infinite possibility where I and so many other artists found ourselves, may serve to reinforce the same old hierarchies. Artists cannot live on clicks, likes, and reblogs. And what if that's all we have left? But what can we do to avoid creating new gatekeepers? How can the internet remain a place of possibility? <laughs> Dude, I dropped, my, I dropped my speech. How can the internet remain a place of possibility? First, we must resist anyone who tells us it's not important for creators to get paid. Do it for exposure are the words of a digital Marie Antoinette. If you own a platform, pay the people who work for it. Pay your creators. And if you are a creator, do not work for large corporations for free. When corporations profit off of unpaid creative labor, they are creating a world where only rich kids get to work creatively. Second, resist attempts to redraw old hierarchies. I have a verified Twitter account, which I love. One morning, I was logged in, and I saw it was possible to only read replies from similarly blue-checked accounts. What clearer way in the world is there to say that if you do not have brand affiliation or a famous name, you are worth being tuned out? Third, profit share. My friend, the photographer Clayton Cubitt, often says that companies that offer users only followers and likes are begging to be disrupted by companies that offer users likes, followers, and also money. The old model where companies just reblog and retweet the, invest, the art that was made on old media. It's not sustainable. But the fourth thing, and this is the most important thing, is we must realize that life on the network is not separable from life off the network. If we want the network to truly defeat old hierarchies, we have to struggle for a juster world offline. The network can make our lives richer and more beautiful, more connected, more informed. It cannot build roads, staff hospitals, or create a humane economy. That's for society to do. We see what happens when the network addresses the needs of society with sites like GoFundMe. GoFundMe is a site where people whose lives are being wrecked by poverty and serious illness post photos of their chemo setups and say, please give me enough money so I don't die. I'm happy that the network is there to help them, but it shouldn't have to. The internet is a place of unlimited possibility, but it contains within it the seeds of its own destruction. We have the key to a whole new world. We don't want to rebuild the old one. And it's up to us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.